boarding TEPCO's bus on our way to a private tour of the power plant, but it comes with restrictions. We can't film part of the grounds for security reasons. This is the final checkpoint. We're just a few hundred meters from the power plant. They want us to turn our cameras off right now, so we can't film past this police car. We are now inside the Fukushima Daiichi power plant property. This is unit four right here, the gray one. As we get closer, these radiation detectors get higher. We're going to go inside and see what kind of progress TEPCO has made on this cleanup. We are inside the building for reactor four. We're going to go inside and see what kind of progress TEPCO has made on this cleanup. We're inside the building for reactor four. The world is watching and many fear what lies beneath this murky water. 1,500 highly radioactive fuel rods inside this pool. They've got to move them outside of this reactor into a safer location. Some say that this is an exceptionally delicate, very dangerous dance for TEPCO. TEPCO has made some progress. This is what TEPCO wants us to see, the heart of the decommissioning work taking place here in Reactor 4. Following the earthquake and tsunami in 2011, a hydrogen explosion tore off the roof of this reactor. At the time, Reactor 4 was not in use, but that explosion sent debris and chunks of concrete into this pool where the nuclear fuel was being stored. We were able to watch the delicate and dangerous work of removing some of the 1,500 radioactive fuel rod assemblies. If the rods break, they could release more radioactive gases. Okay, folks, let's have a look at the TEPCO press release cover page from their press release from November 18, 2013. And in this press release, they state that today on November 18th, we have started conducting the operation to remove fuel from the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Note that the removal was started within 20, with 22 unused fuel assemblies, or so they claim, so they allege. And here are the series of pictures that TEPCO put forth from that press release, and note the pristine conditions of the surroundings of the inside of this, of the, as they allege to be the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Look at the water in this screen captured down in the pool and look at the conditions down there in the pool and note the walls of the pool and look around that and note that this crane this incredibly heavy crane we're led to believe has been reinstalled and is going to remove the fuel when in these documents as we're going to see in just a minute it contradicts that claim and says that hey this there's no structural integrity to unit four anymore and they discuss a sand path and a water path sand path being sand and lead slurry that would be dumped into the pool as opposed to attempting to get water back into these spent fuel pools that lost their inventory of coolant. And here's another screen capture from TEPCO, a better closer look down into the pool. According to TEPCO, they allege this to be the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Okay, here's the cover page to my book, Something Wicked This Way Comes. 
the story of Plumegate, the world's largest provable cover-up. And in my book, chapter 4 on page 183 is called Fear and Loathing on Fukushima Unit 4. I have about 120 pages of evidence from these FOIA documents that contradict the official story on Unit 4 and thus make this unbelievable orchestrated hoax quite apparent and obvious. Okay, here's a screen capture. Talks about Freedom of Information Act from FOIA.gov. You might want to look into that. It's extremely important that we are able to scrutinize government documents. They can redact, they can black out certain things, but nevertheless, as you'll see in my book, we get a really good picture of this massive giant orchestrated cover-up, and it's still ongoing to this day with the Unit 4 offload hoax. It's incredible. Okay, here is a cover page to the FOIAs related to Japan's emergency at the NRC's website, and these are free and available to the public. Anyone can look at them. Here's a cover page from a Wednesday, March 16th, 2011, uh, telephone conversations by NRC officials. Let's see what they had to say about Unit 4. Mike Weber, can you repeat the question, please? Name has been redacted in this next person. But they say, what do you assess was the cause of the fire in Unit 4 last night? Mike Weber, redacted, redacted, and a big redacted section. Male participant, redacted. Mike Weber, redacted. Name, again, redacted. But the person says, yes. Okay, so it is in spent fuel rather than Mike Weber. That's right. The pool structure is no longer in existence. The walls have collapsed. So you have spent fuel sitting there in a pile. Okay, further from that same document, Dave Skeen. Okay, that's great, Chuck. We've been doing some brainstorming here, trying to figure out if they've really lost integrity on three and four spent fuel pools. The structural people are saying there's really no use to put water on there anymore because all you're going to do is spread the contamination. As it steams, you're going to make the contamination worse. Chuck Casto, this is Chuck. I think they only have one spent fuel pool that's lost geometry, right, and lost structure. Dave Skeen, yes, Unit 4. We think they lost, blew the wall out of the side of the spent fuel pool. Chuck Casto, but the other ones... If we could put water in them, you still would want to put water in them, wouldn't you? Male participant. Yes, if we can get water in them, they still are even trying that as we speak now, but are unable to do it. As far as we know, the other three will hold water if we can get it in there to some extent. One of them, they said, seismically, might be cracked, but we don't know that. Dave Skeen. Right, but again, if it's been dry this long, if they've had the Zerk fire, and if it's already, parentheses inaudible, possibly slumped, the fuel that was there, Chuck Casto, yes, Dave Skeen, by putting water in there and steaming it, all you're doing is spreading the contamination with the steam at some point. Chuck Casto, yes, but like I said, Dave, let's go both paths. Let's do a water path and a sand path. Dave Skeen, I agree. You have to be ready to do both things. And we have to assume that one and two are headed the same way, and eventually we will have to do sand there. Chuck Casto, right. You're right. Let's go ahead and do both solution paths. So recommend one and two water, three and four, since they had Zerk water reactions to do something different. Dave Skeen, yes, and that's probably just drop sand and try to shield. You're trying to cut down dose at this point, so you're just trying to cover up the rubble that's left. Chuck Casto. Now, did you read the NUREG? That's one of their manuals. Now, did you read the NUREG? I know you read the NUREG, Dave, about putting water on the molten fuel, that it can help. They still recommend it. Dave Skeen. Right. Chuck Casto. It depends on how you do it, you know. Dave Skeen. Yes. Chuck Casto. Go about spreading it. And also, it depends on whether there is a crust built up. Dave Skeen, that's right. Right, because you'll be insulating the rubble, too. So the heat is going to build up, and it's going to last longer. But at some point, you have to figure out what's worse. To let the things be hot and burn a little longer, even if the shield is insulated, or is it worse to spread more contamination? So that's the kind of line you've got to walk to try to figure it out. And if you guys are on the ground over there, you can probably get better information than we have. Okay, from later in the same document, page 427. 
Chuck Casto, I've got to get to another meeting, but I just wanted to tell you that Tony took, redacted, 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 for me, I'm ever more convinced that there's nothing there. There's major damage to that building, and I just have to stake my career on it. But I don't see that there's any structural integrity there at all. Redacted, redacted. Redacted. You know, there was steam last night at 5 o'clock when the helicopter went by. Steam or smoke. Who knows? It might have been a fire inside the building. You can't tell. Female participant. Unit 4, correct? Chuck Casto. Do what? Female participant. Unit 4? Chuck Casto. Yes. Unit 4. Okay, and by the way, I should mention that Chuck Casto is in March of 2011. He is the lead NRC executive for support to Japan. So these these guys are, are, are they're not new to this. They're very knowledgeable. Casto has been consistent all along. My research has shown me he hasn't flip-flopped or changed his story, although I don't see him speaking a lot in later documents, only in earlier documents. But to prove a point that it wasn't just a couple days afterwards that they thought the pools were dry or cracked and then oops we made a mistake and after 72 hours or you know four to five days we realized that mistake and and changed our opinion on it that is absolutely not true let's look at a document from March 20th now okay and let's see what they have to say in this document from a telephone conference call from Sunday March 20 2011 Marty Virgilio but that's pulling on the piece of what was part of it it's not it's not a substantial drawback of the case because quite frankly we still think four is a melt on the floor in there Charlie Miller right okay and a little bit later in that document Larry camper says yeah the lube oil fire may very well have been you know something far more significant coming out of uniform because what we're now beginning to think at least Don cool and I talking with the protective measure team you know it may well be that that was a seminal event in which the volatiles were deposited out there on soil to the north northwest of the site and if that's the case the good news is that the volatiles are already out there the bad news is the thing we're all trying to chew on is what's going on in unit four now in terms of any future consequences from interaction of melted spent fuel material with concrete and so forth and folks what happened was the explosion and in these documents in several places they talk about these pieces of spent fuel and radioactive spent fuel debris being deposited outside of the spent fuel pool and like he said in this north northwest of the site there was indeed a very heavy deposit of a very high radioactive material so this falls perfectly in line with what we're saying about unit four there was an explosion there was the walls were damaged it lost its water it had a zirconium fire it melted on the floor it was rubble on the floor now this is a different story than what we're hearing from abc cbs and a lot of alternative and a lot of youtube channels okay let's look at a march 15th email from margie Gonzalez to joffrey miller and in this email she says i couldn't sleep again last night Michelle was doing a shift in the op center, parentheses, protective measures team last night. She texted me, quote, U2 X vessel, comma, U4 Zerk fire, SFP, comma, catastrophe, end quote. And there's a couple sections. It says outside of scope have been redacted. I'll repeat that one section for you. U2 X vessel, U4 Zerk fire, SFP catastrophe unit 4 Zerk fire spent fuel pool catastrophe now here's a screen capture from the IAEA which says it was reported to by the Japanese authorities that the spent fuel storage pond at unit 4 of the Daiichi nuclear power plant is on fire and radioactivity is being released directly into the atmosphere okay from March 15 admission by the IAEA and Japanese government spent fuel pools on fire Here's an email from Jennifer Yule from March 21st. And in this email, it's sent to a number of people, but in the email on the 21st, they're still discussing this. And it says, the question Naval Reactors is asking is whether the unit four spent fuel pool will reach concrete ablation temperatures. Jason is talking to them today. I agree about the fact that RES slash Sandia is a great team and we at NRC are trying to get the federal family to use our source term. So folks on the 21st, 
here's proof they're still discussing trying to figure out did that melted fuel burn through the concrete bottom of that spent fuel pool through the rebar through the concrete and down into the torus there was another uh, section where they discussed that it might melt down and go into the torus and that would be a very serious problem if it did okay here's another email from the 21st march 21st 2011 from charles tinkler and this email says right now we have two actions we are following up one clarification and assessment of potential radiological release source terms for Fukushima units 3 and 4 spent fuel pools. Earlier estimates were made based on earlier peach bottom analysis, and follow-up is needed to address Fukushima and complete dry-out and concrete attack. Clarification sought by the PMT. Number two, we have received additional requests from naval reactors, so on and so forth. So, there's other requests from naval reactors, but one of naval reactors' requests, what they want to know, and even as far as into the 21st now, this is this is not just 72 hours after they made a mistake and they changed their minds. No, on March 21st, they're still trying to figure out, did that melted fuel burn through the bottom of spent fuel pool number four? Again, this is a totally different story than the, what we're getting from mainstream and alternative and a lot of these Facebook uh, nuclear pages and these YouTube nuclear uh, channels, so on and so forth, anti-nuclear channels, I should say. Okay, here's another screen capture from the FOIA documents that show on March 18, they're modeling the source terms provided to NARAC include 100% of the total spent fuel was released to the atmosphere from Unit 4. So they're, they're taking that very seriously, okay? There's been no water, no power uh, to the facility for weeks. And certainly the water cannons and those attempts, the NRC officials say that's just a waste of time. It's not doing any good. So these pools suffered the worst case scenario, prolonged station blackout. This was known early on. They didn't just flip flop and change their mind. They did that publicly. But behind the scenes in these Freedom of Information Act documents, you can clearly see they're still taking it very seriously. They know there's been a melt on the floor rubble on the floor of unit four and they discussed a sand path should we put sand and lead chunks in it can we add water you know and it's certainly if you look again at those pictures that tepco put forth and some of these propaganda sites that are promoting the unit four offload hoax there's no way the pool can be in such a pristine condition there's no way the building can be have been rebuilt to that condition especially considering talk of three four five hundred rim dose rates, even 600 rim dose rates at the Fukushima facility not long after the catastrophic uh, tsunami and earthquake of March 11th, 2011. So none of this jives, the official story, none of it jives with what we read in these documents. Okay, next screen capture. And this is when I just want to show you what the president has called for as far as a scenario being run. And Jim Wiggins says, what's the, what's the president's case? Question mark. Male participant. It's, it's bounding. It includes the fuel in three reactors, the fuel in four spent fuel pools. It does not include the common spent fuel pool around unit four, nor reactors five and six or any spent fuel pools there and it's assumed a release based over a four to five day period. So you can see the president's worst case scenario, and if you back up on the screen capture, they're talking about the, you know, there's so many worst cases being thrown around, they're sick of hearing the phrase worst case, right? And then it leads into the president's case. Well, president's worst case is what they're talking about, and it's all four spent fuel pools, and that includes unit four. And you see the model we just looked at from NARAC, they're source term was including a hundred percent burn up of unit four okay here we go from march 18th now here's why there's this big hoax is underway they don't want you to know the truth about nuclear power that we're sitting ducks we're sitting ducks right now here's a march 18th email from gary holohan or i should uh, uh back up on this one and, and first of all the the email preceding this one is in regards to the president has directed a comprehensive review of the safety of the domestic fleet he's contacted nrc so give me a re review of the domestic fleet how safe are we okay in response to that request is being circulated this knowledge around nrc during this time and gary holohan responds to marty virgilio and says in regards to this comprehensive review that obama's called for marty I think this is right on target. In addition, for the long-term look, we likely will need to revisit the issue of non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools 
of which I recall there are many. I alerted Eric to the non-seismic spent fuel pool fact yesterday. Okay, so there's admission, one piece of evidence of admission that we have non-seismically spent fuel pools, non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools in the United States right now, right now, post Fukushima, nothing's being done. Okay, here's another email from Gary Holohan again, from March 17th, subject, seismic qualification of spent fuel pools. Eric, this is a heads up from a congressional briefing that Mike Johnson, Jennifer Yule, OCA, and I participated in. One of the questioners asked if all spent fuel pools were designed to the same seismic standards as the reactors. I answered that this was true of some, but not all spent fuel pools. I'm quite sure that my statement is true since NRR did a study of this topic long ago. Some spent fuel pools are simply not seismically qualified. They have mitigation measures, but are not seismically qualified. And notice he says a study of this topic was done long ago. They've known this for a long time, folks, before Fukushima and after Fukushima. Okay, this next screen capture is from the cover page from a recent public meeting from September 18th, 2013. That was in California. The meeting type of meeting is called Japan Lessons Learned Project Directorate Public Meeting. And so this is where they discuss lessons learned from Japan. Should we change anything or do anything differently over here? But what I want you to hear is a quote from Jennifer Yule, Deputy Director for Reactor Safety Programs. Okay, and remember, this is recent. This is from September 18th, 2013. Okay, post Fukushima, and here's what she says. She introduces herself, so on and so forth, but she gets down to the meat of the subject here, and she says, quote, Now, the Fukushima events did not result in any loss of inventory, or caused any kind of heat up in any of the spent fuel pools affected. Nonetheless, we still wanted to study this to blah, 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 blah. So let me say that one more time. This is a public meeting. This is what is being sold to the American public. Now, quote, now the Fukushima events did not result in any loss of inventory or cause any kind of heat up in any of the spent fuel pools affected, end quote. And I realized that the gist of their story is that Early on, they made a mistake. They thought there had been no water. <clears throat> they thought the walls had blown out, but they were wrong. And that was a very short period of time when information was foggy, and then they changed their story. Well, publicly, they did change their story. But as I've shown you here, behind the scenes on the 20th and 21st, they're still trying to figure out, did that melt on the floor burn through the concrete of, of Unit 4 spent fuel pool? And that's just a simple fact, undeniable fact. Okay, and that ends this uh, addition to the Unit 4 Offload Hoax Investigation, and I hope you guys spread this information around because this is damn serious. Not just the fact that Unit 4 burned all the way up and all that was released radiation to the atmosphere, but this massive orchestrated hoax that covers all sectors of media into Facebook, YouTube, mainstream, alternative. We need to begin talking about this and do something about it. Okay, this is your host, Patrick Penry. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. Over and out. Oh,